everyone. I'm Amy Milne and I'm presenting today with an all-star group of fiber artists whose work includes both making quilts and writing about them, and in some cases on them. Um, thank you for joining us for this Texel Talks event. Be sure to check out our website, quiltalliance.org and um, social media for registration and recordings for all of the presentations in this series. We are thrilled to collaborate with our fellow fiber organizations on this community effort. Thank you to Chris Esselgroth for playing us in. Chris played the theme tune that he wrote for our new podcast, Running Stitch. Before I introduce our moderator, Yannick and Smucker, I'd like to point out a few buttons on your Zoom window that you're probably already familiar with, Q&A and chat. And although you're all muted and your webcam is turned off now, we would love to hear, um, hear from you and have your questions and feedback. We've left some time at the end for questions and uh, we invite you to put any uh, questions you have in the Q&A area. And we invite you to put any feedback, greetings, or technical questions in the chat area. We'll take a brief pause after the panel so that you can uh, add your comments while they're still fresh in your mind. I'm so pleased that my colleague Yannickin Smucker is moderating our panel today. Yannickin has served as a Quilt Alliance board member, president, volunteer, and now she is fulfilling a longtime dream to host a podcast. And the Quilt Alliance is the lucky benefactor of that uh, dream. Running Stitch, a QSOS podcast, is a brand new effort hosted and co-produced by Yannickin uh, with co-producer and QA project manager, Emma Parker. Today's panel discussion will be recorded and released as the sixth episode in our first season of Running Stitch. Running Stitch explores quilt stories, revealing the inner thoughts, feelings, and motivations of contemporary quilt makers by drawing from Quilters SOS, Save Our Stories, the long-running oral history project created by the Quilt Alliance in 1999. We'll dig into the QSOS audio archive and sometimes the Go Tell It and Story B video collections to listen to excerpts from past interviews and bring back interviewees to ask them about what they are working on and thinking about presently. Guests include Victoria Finley Wolf, Carolyn Maslumi, Thomas Knauer, Melanie Testa, and Ginny Beyer. Thank you, Yannickin, and our panelists, Meg Cox, Francis O'Rourke Dow, Sean Kimber, and Gwen Westerman for being here today to tell your stories. Yannickin, I'll pass it off to you. Thank you so much, Amy. Hi, I'm Yannickin Smucker. I'm really delighted to be with you all this afternoon. And I'm thrilled to be participating in this panel discussion with uh, with this great group of artists and writers. Um, I spent a lot of my time currently writing about quilts. I'm a historian and I'm thinking a lot about quilts in the New Deal era, Great Depression era right now. And so I'm spending more time writing than actually making, but I've also been really inspired to be making some quilts that are in inspired by my research right now. And that's one of the things we'll hopefully talk about today, how our writing and our work with quilts intersects. So enough about me for now. Um, I'm going to turn things over to our panelists. Each panelist is going to share a few slides about their work, both in the writing context and the quilt context and how they intersect. And uh, we'll turn things over first to uh, my good friend, Meg Cox. Hello, I'm, I'm Meg Cox. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, when my mother uh, taught me how to quilt in 1988, I was working as a staff writer in the Wall Street Journal in New York City. And I was covering the business of the arts. If someone had told me then that two decades later, 2008, I would publish a 600 page resource guide for quilters, I would have laughed hysterically. First slide.
There we go. Okay. But in between those years, I got married, had a baby, and left the Wall Street Journal to pursue my lifelong dream of writing books. Quilting became much more of a personal passion when I had a little kid. So after writing several successful books on family traditions, I started looking around for another topic, and I thought, I wonder if there's a journalist's book about quilting. So I bought myself a ticket to the AQS show in Paducah in 2002 and had my mind blown. I was dazzled by the variety of quilts, the size of the crowd, the quality of the quilts, and really very much so by the incredible entrepreneurial energy that I saw there. Um, it took me a year to convince Workman Publishing that this was their kind of book, but I've been writing and lecturing about quilts ever since. Next slide. To coincide with the publication of the Quilters Catalog, I started a free online newsletter. It's now called Quilt Journalist Tells All, and I've been writing and publishing it for 12 years. It's currently sponsored by Moda. It comes out every month, and it's full of news, reviews, and the occasional rant. I spotlight designers, teachers, shows, products, and organizations whose work I admire, and I provide lots of links so my readers can explore more deeply. It's full of my original reporting and stories that subscribers tell me they don't find elsewhere. And I love it because I'm using all the journalistic skills I developed in 17 years at the Wall Street Journal and also adding my boundless personal passion as a quilter for a craft that just keeps reinventing itself. Next slide. Since the quilters catalog uh, came out, I've had my writing on quilts published in a wide array of uh, publications, only some of which are shown on this slide. Uh, one of the ones that's missing is a trade journal called the Fab Shop News, which is a publication that goes to people who own quilt shops. And uh, for more than five years, I had a column there that was actually called Trade Talk, where I dove deep into these nitty gritty business stories about inventory, merchandising, new products, and a lot more. And I, you know, things like I did a column once about this huge battle between two makers of long arm machines, Gamel and ABM. For a while, I wrote a regular feature in the Quilt Life magazine. That was a magazine that was run by Ricky Timms and uh, Alex Anderson. And uh, this regular feature I did was called Look Who's Quilting Now. And it was a profile of an unexpected quilter. I think the most unusual writing gil, uh, gig I ever had uh, with regard to quilts was that for a while, I actually had a gossip column in Mark Lipinski's Quilter's Home magazine. It was his idea and it was called Megabytes. But I also managed to actually get uh, a serious essay into the Daily Beast, which is an online uh, news, um, news organization. And I wrote an essay in 2009 that's saying that quilts had actually predicted the election of Barack Obama if only the pundits had paid attention. That there was a flood of Obama quilts and hardly any Bush quilts. Next slide. So once in a while, I even managed to sneak a quilting article into the Wall Street Journal, which feels especially good. I did one about the first year of QuiltCon. Uh, I did one about Denise Schmidt. Uh, and um, I also did one about how the town of Paducah used quilts uh, literally as an economic engine to revive the town. Um, I just learned last year that this article helped Paducah be selected as one of nine UNESCO creative cities in the United States power of the press. Next slide. For the last two years, I've been a staff writer at Quilt Folk Magazine, a quarterly publication that contains neither projects nor ads. Every issue is a deep dive into the quilt culture of a single state. And this experience has been a real departure for me as a freelancer because we travel as a team and it's really, really fun with a photographer and Mary Fonz and uh, it's just been an enormous privilege and a pleasure to travel this way and view the whole country state by state by state through the lens of quilts and quilters. So while I do write an occasional blog post or article about other topics, quilts will remain my chief obsession going forward because I know a compelling topic when I see one. Thank you. Hey everyone, this is Frances Dow. Um, and I'm gonna read something that I wrote, keeps me from rambling. So if something interests me, I want to investigate it. And my favorite way to dig in is by writing. Um, first slide. 
for the last 20 years, I've made a career as a children's book author and have used fiction to explore my various interests, passions, and obsessions as they've arisen. Folk life and freedom schools, urban farming, Lewis and Clark, Mean Girls, and on more than one occasion, chickens. So when I took up quilt making some 13 years ago, it was only a matter of time before I wanted to write about it. My first quilt novel, slide, Birds in the Air is a mix of autobiography, escapism, and quilt history. In this contemporary story, 43-year-old Emma Berg moves to a small town in the Blue Ridge Mountains with her family, where she finds an antique quilt in a trunk hidden in the attic of her 100-year-old house. When she takes the quilt to her local quilt shop, she is quickly sucked into the cult of quilt makers. She makes her first quilt and just can't stop. Aside from the move to the mountains and the quilt in the attic, much of Emma's early life as a quilter mirrors my own. Like Emma, I made my first quilt in my early 40s and never looked back. I quickly found a community of quilters, several communities actually, both locally and online, and like Emma, I developed a strong interest in quilt history. Slide. It was this interest in quilt history mine, not Emma's, that led to my novel Friendship Album 1933. I'd read Patchwork Souvenirs of the 1933 World's Fair by Barbara Brackman and Mary Kay Waldvogel and was captivated by the story of the Sears quilt contest in the middle of the Great Depression. I wanted to more deeply imagine the world in which this contest took place, and so I decided to make up my own Depression-era city, Milton Falls, Ohio, and explore the lives of five cultures who come together to form an unlikely be. Friendship Album 1933 was a side project, and I had to set the novel down after 120 pages of writing. Still, it was a story I kept returning to, and I wanted to finish it. As is my way, I came up with an absolutely preposterous scheme. I decided I would read it online as a work in progress. Thus, the Quilt Fiction Podcast was born. Slide. Beginning in June 2018 and running through May of 2019, I read and wrote a novel that ended up being over 500 pages long. If you're interested, the podcast audiobook is still available uh, via iTunes and on the Quilt Fiction website slide. I also have a collection of short stories about contemporary quilters. The stories of Margaret Goes Modern explore the lives of women who find purpose and meaning in making quilts. Although I hope anyone might enjoy these stories, I wrote them specifically with an audience of quilters in mind, which is to say I didn't shy away from writing about the joy and the heartbreak of the quilting process. There are plenty of scenes where women eye their design boards, slash away improvisationally with their rotary cutters, or complain about their wonky half-square triangles. I name drop famous quilters, Kay Facet, Bonnie Hunter, Mary Ann, and Mary Fonz, with complete lack of regard for my non-quilting audience. If they don't know, they can look it up. Slide. Although all of my books about quilts and quilt makers are fiction, they also serve as documentaries of a sort. They reflect my own life as a quilter and as an adult. They're about being middle-aged and menopausal, about making dinner when you'd rather be making art. My quilt fiction digs into the complexities of women's friendships, as well as the increasing role that loss plays in our lives as we get older. When I go to quilt shows, I always want to know the stories behind the quilts I see, not just the pattern names and the creative process, but what the quilter was thinking about when she sat down at her machine or carried her bundle of freshly stitched piecing over to the ironing board. We walk into our sewing spaces, dragging our lives behind us and our quilts bear witness. That's what I want to write about, the stories the quilts would tell if they could. So hi, I'm Sean uh, and I make quilts and I write my words directly on them. Um, I use text on quilts for a few different reasons, um, for education, to um, 
to advance propaganda <laughs> and also just for the art of it. So first slide. So I just have five examples to show you. So here's a quilt um, where the words, in essence, I'm a sophisticated cotton picker. It's the uh, summary sentence of Eartha Kitt's autobiography. It is a way to talk about her, um, her rearing as a black woman in the South and uh, acknowledging all that she became throughout her life. But a good question to ask is, you know, if we took those words off, this would be a perfectly okay quilt on its own. And so what are the purpose of the words there? And in the case of this one, it is my way of putting my presence into the quilt um, and turning it into a sort of self-portrait. Next slide. I also ask questions about identity and difference. And so this is a quilt where I am exploring the idea of home um, and particularly the mythic Southern home. Uh, this is a poem written by a friend of mine, Autumn Kent, um, who was also a Southerner transported to the very strange North. And we uh, often have this conversation about what we miss about being Southern and have little access to in our new homes. Um, the text here is particularly reminiscent of um, the very simple menus that you would find in hole in the wall restaurants down South. Next slide. Uh, then I was traveling a lot and I wanted a limited way um, and constrained way to uh, express myself in quilt form. And so I took the idea from magnetic poetry where you have a finite number of words in a little box and you construct the most beautiful poem that you could from that constrained set of words. So I took a very, very small set of words and built this poem. Um, I will make a quilt using text, using any materials and any technique. Next slide. Uh, I'm also trying to convey mood and sometimes it doesn't take very many words to get you to start thinking about who you are, where you are, and what you think about life. So this was a 2019 quilt originally meant um, to express my opinion of our current national leadership, but also um, in reflecting on my own middle-agedness. Um, so I do kind of face life a little bit differently now. Next slide. And finally, um, sometimes the words are everything. So I originally made this quilt in 2015. Um, in commemoration of the death of Eric Garner. And um, yeah, I'm just gonna, I, I wanted to make these words as a meditative way of um, guiding myself through the experience of trying to figure out what the heck is going on. I never had any intention of this being a quilt that would be seen by the world. Um, I made the words in silence word by word, phrase by phrase, um, just getting a sense for that labor of saying these words and flowing into darkness. Thanks. Hello everyone, I'm Gwen Westerman. I'm a poet, a quilt artist, a scholar. Uh, some of my earliest memories are of writing, reading, and um, quilts. Our house was full of them uh, when I was growing up as a child. My grandmother tried to teach me to quilt when I was about 10, but I couldn't follow her strict rules, so she took away the scissors and the fabric and um, I didn't pick up quilting until I was 40, uh, much later. And throughout my, throughout my life, um, people knew me as a writer. There were other people who knew me as a quilter, and there were other people who knew me as a scholar, and I kept those three things separate. And it wasn't until about 2012 when um, those worlds all came together. Uh, next slide. 
Um, my Dakota heritage uh, informs my work in significant ways. And in 2012, um, a new history of Dakota people in Minnesota was published. And when we were trying to figure out what artwork to put on the cover, my co-author said, Gwen, one of your quilts should be on there. So my quilt and my writing physically came together in Minnesota Makoche, the land of the Dakota. Uh, the following year in 2013, I published Follow the Blackbirds, which is a collection of poetry in English and Dakota. And um, there are a lot of poems in there about quilting um, and the way we take pieces and bring things together. And that's also true of um, the work that I do with Dakota language vitalization. Um, my poems have appeared in other places. I have a, a, an essay in poetry um, and then some new work in New Poets of Native Nations. And uh, now it seems like it's just a natural thing and it takes much, much less energy uh, to have all the facets of my creativity in, in one place. Next slide, please. This is called Wachi Au, or Song for the Horses. And it's important to me to tell a lot of the traditional stories, uh, to preserve a lot of the traditional stories in another way, in a visual way, uh, because uh, most often these uh, stories are oral or they're in song form. And this tells the creation of horses and how they were sent to people on the earth from the creator uh, and they were dancing as they came. Next slide. Um, there is a lot of work being done in uh, a number of places to strengthen and support the bison herds and to keep them from disappearing. And so I went to um, Blue Mountain State Park to look at a bison herd and I stood on a high point and I photographed 360 degrees around me to get an idea, uh, a good view of the landscape. And when I got home and started looking at those photos, the horizon 360 degrees around me had wind turbines. Um, so this is the manifestation of that, that view and the words on the bottom. Uh, is the voice of the bison. Um, many things are chasing me, but I'm not afraid because I still live. Next slide, please. Um, here's another place where my poetry and my quilting came together. Um, the piece there you see there is called or we come from the stars because that's our creation story as Dakota people that uh, where we came to be Dakota um, is where um, our spirits came from the stars. Next slide. Um, the quilt on the left is called Cheske's Pardon, and it was published in uh, Quilts and Human Rights. And it has um, a lot of meaning in terms of our history. Um, and um, it's a, um, a significant event um, at the end of a war between the Dakota people and, and the United States and 38 men were hanged in the largest mass execution in the history of the United States on December 26, 1862. And this quilt um, uh, recognizes uh, Chasquet's role uh, in, in those events and the words that he spoke um, toward the end of his life. I can't imagine now trying to keep my writing and my, um, sorry, there's my timer. <laughs> I can't imagine trying to keep my writing and my, my quilting separated because quilting is another form of storytelling. Um, and the more ways we can share our stories, I think uh, the, the more uh, we can connect with each other. So 
So thank you. Thank you, Gwen, so much. Thank you, everyone. Um, let's go ahead and bring on all our panelists in the view. So if everybody can start your video and start your uh, unmute, uh, we should be able to, I'm going to stop sharing for just a moment. Great. Um, and I'll hop off and turn it over to you, Yannickin, and then come back and uh, sort of close us out when you're done, okay? Let's leave about, um, let's leave about 10 minutes for questions. Sounds good. Thank you, Amy. And thank you, each of the panelists, for uh, introducing yourselves and introducing us to your work. Uh, really um, powerful pieces all the way around and look forward to this discussion. Um, we'll... Since we're on Zoom, it's always hard to know how to jump in. So just make sure you're um, signaling if, if we're not seeing that you want to speak. Um, but I'd like to first start off asking how um, one of the ways that quilts and writing are perhaps similar, or perhaps different. How do the themes and ideas and inspiration for either of these forms um, manifest themselves in, in various ways? Is it a similar process or are they quite, quite different um, when you're writing? compared to sewing. Um, if you want to hop in and, and start, go ahead, or I can... Uh... You can call on us. <laughs> Francis, yeah, go ahead. Well, you know, I talked about how, you know, from, I'm very notional. I like read something and suddenly I have to know all about it and uh, I go deep into rabbit holes. Um, and, and, and that, again, in a lot of my stories are written that way, are novels, that's where they start. You know, you often move away from that originating idea, um, and, and, but that's, it's, it's a real desire to explore. And I think a lot of my quilts are that way too. One of the quilts that I showed in that last slide is called Sit-In. Um, and it, it was for, I saw the sketch by a, a, a marvelous artist named Beverly Buchanan. Um, and it's just a, a, a sketch of a chair, of a rustic chair. And I fell in love with the chair and suddenly I was all about chairs and I was drawing chairs and, uh, and then making a, a template of, of, a, of a chair. And then, I, then, and from there I was like, all right, let's do a chair quilt and, have, and you know, I imagine like Andy Warhol soup cans and then four big chairs. And I ended up just cutting out about 150 chairs out of colors and then playing her and it just, you know, it just started because I saw a picture of a chair and that's very much my process and everything, which means that uh, I do a lot of revising because I'm always going down rabbit hole after rabbit hole. But yeah, so it's very similar in that way. But, yeah, it sounds like it's, yeah, both ways. It's like, yeah, diving in and, and exploring the tangents. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah, Meg. Well, I would say they're very different for me, partly because the reason that I make them is uh, the audience is very different. I make, I write words mostly for my living and I write about things I care about, but um, I'm, it's what is that assignment require of me? And sometimes it's, you know, my own uh, idea, but with quilts, it's it, it coming from a much more personal place for me. I mean, I have taught uh, some beginner classes, but I'm not somebody who's making samples or who's making something that I'm going to exhibit in a show. So I think I'm coming from different places, but I think what is the same for me is that um, just my method is not to just start throwing either uh, the quilt together, the design of a quilt together, or an article. I'm a real planner. So, uh, I, I, you know, I'm, I have to pull a lot of stuff together. I don't just know what, like, the lead of my story is going to be. So I'm pretty meticulous and methodical about gathering lots of information. And it's like it has to get to a boiling point before then, like, the initial image or the initial words become clear to me. And it's, it's, it, it works that, pretty much that way for quilts. Anyone else want to hop in on this question? All right. So um, kind of following up on that, Meg, since you do write about quilts um, from a journalistic perspective, um, how does studying and writing and communicating about quilts in this way, how does it affect, does it affect the way you make quilts or your process? Or do you 
ever <laughs> learn about it, research something and write about it and then like, oh, I want to try this myself. You got to do one of those. Yeah, yes, it does. I, 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 was, I really love this question because I never thought about that before. And uh, one thing is um, when I was writing my book, I was writing a 600 page resource guide for uh, for quilters and there are 12 projects in there but the idea was that all the projects would be from famous quilters and not from me because I'm not a pattern maker but uh, but we really wanted beginner projects so I ended up having to create four projects so that was a way in which my writing you know, and so I, I did some of these, uh, I did, for example, a picture quilt that is my husband and I kissing on our wedding day, like a la Warhol, it's the same image four times, and it's in the middle of a, of a quilt. And I ended up teaching that, teaching, you know, very simple quilts, but it, me teaching quilting was because I wrote about quilting. So that was, that was a weird one. So it has sometimes, or I have met somebody, I've interviewed somebody, and I thought, I, I really have to try that. So yeah, there is, there's a jump off there too. Sure. Any of the others of you? Well, yeah. when I started work on Friendship Album 1933, I love 1930s quilts anyways. And, and so that was a great excuse to try to make some of the quilts that my characters were making. It's, a, it's almost like set building. It was really fun to do a crown of thorns. And, and um, although, although I'll never machine a king size quilt, a, a machine quilt on my sewing machine, a king size quilt again. But, but it is fun. It's a way of immersing myself into character. And I also think when I'm making quilts, I sometimes have a heightened awareness, especially when I mess up, which I do on a fairly regular basis, like, oh, I can use this in a story. So it's kind of this meta observation. Um, and and then, no, then no mistake is wasted because I can write about it. Um, Gwen or Sean, I'll give you a chance if you'd like to, to respond to this question. Okay. So I really see, um, I, I once, I had a, well, when I was doing my own research, I had a um, one of the, the narrators I was interviewing told me that um, the, uh, the quilting stitch is almost like a signature and you can tell um, someone's quilting stitch, it's unique. I don't know if that's really true, but I do see some interesting similar similarities between um, the, the mark of words, um, text, even when it's written <laughs> in a word processor as we do today, and the stitch. Do you, any of you see some of those um, similarities or perhaps ways that those two things are different and similarly between language and pattern? Weigh in on that one. I think it's, it's a similar process in terms of creation for me, because I'm taking small pieces and making a larger image, whether those are words or pieces of fabric. And um, I can definitely relate to Francis about falling into rabbit holes and coming out the other side with something totally different. Um, but a lot of times if something just doesn't quite work for me, I put it aside or I take it apart and uh, it becomes three different poems or it becomes uh, the landscape for the landscape background for a quilt. Um, and oftentimes I'm driven by word before image, like in Wachi Au, the song there. Um, and then sometimes the images come first. So it's, it's a similar creative process for me, taking those pieces and making something larger that tells a story. So I would say that um, I, I, I think we are a rabbit hole society here on the screen. Um, <laughs> so, um, but for me, it's a chicken, egg, or cart horse uh, question of whether it's the words that come first or just an, a, an idea for a design, and then I need the words that go with the design. But for the most part, I'm looking for the most uh, timeless statement that I can make. Uh, that encompasses the issues before us uh, that I want people to engage with. Um, so, for instance, I will never make a Trump quilt, but I will make quilts about the human rights issues that we all face day to day, sometimes multiple times a day right now. And uh, because those are timeless, it's not just today that we discover there's racism, it's been a constant um, for centuries. Uh, so what is the broader statement that can be made that 
um, people years from now, not knowing what happened on July 8th, will be able to engage with and still get something from the expression. Thank you, Sean. I, in particular, when I see your quilts, I see the words are the pattern, and I really like um, the way um, it kind of blurs the line between its language and pattern all connected um, in a really powerful that way. Anyone else want to jump in on this question before we move on? Meg. Yeah, I, I am thinking now of, of playing more with the quilting in words. Uh, not not just a service design, and um, this came to me partly, you know, speaking of how writing uh, the writing influences me. Um, the first issue of Quilt Folk I got to do, I got to my first profile was Gwen Marston, and so I was in her studio in uh, Beaver Island, and somebody had written her a letter, um, a quilted letter. And she had it on her in, in a very special place by her sewing machine. And I, and, that, and I just kept thinking about that letter and what a beautiful, special way that was to write to somebody. Uh, and so for my sis sister's 65th birthday, that's what I gave her. And so it was, it was a, a quilted letter and it had you know, embellishments and her favorite colors and all that kind of stuff. But to have the words be, you know, really the point and again it is my writing it is that um she said that's your handwriting i mean i would know that from you know a mile away so um i think there's so many different ways that that can go together mm -hmm. sean mentioned uh when she was presenting her slides how um particularly the i can't breathe quilt was almost an act of meditation um, and I, many quilt makers in, in the QSOS um, oral history project talk about quilting as a meditative act. And I certainly see that and or feel that in my own um, quilt making as well. In what ways um, are either or both writing and sewing meditative for any of you? I have never had a meditative moment writing in my life, so I'm really curious to hear if anyone's going to say yes. And even with, and I have to say with sewing, chain piecing is probably the most meditative, but otherwise there's so much movement in quilting, which is one of the things that I like about it. I mean, you're moving from station to station. That's my, I always say knitting is sitting and quilting is moving. And so I find knitting very meditative, but, but quilting, and that, again, I like that um, that jumping around a little bit. Um, so no, <laughs> but, no, but what, writing never. Writing is no. <laughs> well, I, I second that. My writing is never meditative for me. It is hard. It's just hard. I, I love it, and I love parts of it, and I love having done it. But it's. It, I just. I just don't think it ever is. Uh, for quilting, it's, some things are. Most things are not. I think putting on a binding is. Some people don't like that. I. For me, that I like that. I'll do. I'll do some for you. John. I like that, and I and I and I think one of the rare times that I had a real meditative experience with quilting was a, a memorial quilt I made of my husband's shirts, mm -hmm. and I had already made one quilt from his shirts for for uh, his granddaughter. So I had gotten over like the terror of just you know cutting through it, and once I had, and I was working on one for me, and mine was much smaller pieces. Um, that became meditative. Take, even taking the shirts apart became meditative. And, you know, uh, it was a lot of it was improv. And some of that was meditative in a way that quilting usually is not for me at all, because it's usually more of a pattern. And that was very improv. So I, so I think sometimes for quilting, never for writing. That's my answer. <laughs> So writing, yeah, go ahead, Sean, jump in. Yeah. I just want to leap in and say that there are forms of journaling that are deeply, deeply meditative. And so especially when I'm trying to find the right way to say the thing that I want to say, I will write uh, for set periods of time for days and then come back and read and the, the nugget's going to be in there somewhere. And sometimes just putting something down on paper is a release. And so I think the problem is you guys are doing it for your living and perhaps that intentionality that others are going to see this and you're like, oh my God, it has to be perfect. That, that can impede that. And so just understanding that some of us don't want the public to see what we write. And so I have the same problem with quilting now, by the way, is I'm terrified to sit down and start making a quilt sometimes. And so it's an well, interesting 
Yeah, Sean raises an important part point it's about the kind of writing, which I, like Meg as a journalist, is her writing is quite different than Gwen as a poet. Um, is writing poetry meditative? It can be, uh, but it's it's a similar process for me. And whether it's it's um, poetry or or fiction or a short essay, um, I do a lot of journaling and and try to write every day, even if all I'm doing is making you know loops on the page because there's nothing in my head to come out. Uh, but I write with a pencil and I write on paper because there's a texture and a feel to that that is very calming to me. Um, but I love editing. I'm a technical writer by profession. So um, reading, reading what I've written out loud and listening for pickups um, is, is also a process that I enjoy. I shouldn't have said that out loud, but I enjoy it. <laughs> But, but the, you know, same thing for me, chain piecing, uh, strip cutting. Um, By, a binding, I hadn't thought about that. And also some of the hand quilting that I have done mm -hmm. has been meditative. Now that, I don't know, yeah, so that's kind of the, yes, that is meditative for me. Well, I want to segue here. Um, uh, Sean in particular um, sort of started talking about, um, well, I think, maybe a couple of you about as you start a project. Um, I was thinking about the comparison uh, between a blank page and the, the uncut cloth or the blank design wall, however it is that you work. Um, what is it like to, to start a, a project in either of these forms? Are there um, things that are similar about that process, challenging or, or less so? Yeah, I, I, first of all, I think the creative process is the creative process. So you tend to start with a big head of steam. Like, this is amazing. My idea is amazing. I am a genius. And that you, you go through that burst of energy, which is fabulous. And then all of a sudden you realize, this isn't amazing. I'm not a genius. I don't think I can do this. But I, the, the good thing about having done both, but, I mean, I've written all my life, but I made quotes long enough now no that it's like if you go and knowing you're gonna have to revise I, to me that's the greatest liberty um and i, I am a uh, it's much cheaper as a writer to revise and as a quilt to revise to revise but i do both and so i go in knowing that probably the big idea that propelled me and motivate motivate me is motivated me is going to go by the wayside but also that there's this process of discovery um, that's amazing and that which is my favorite part of the creative process so after once you start failing is when you get into the really interesting places but I always know there's going to be a lot of revising going on and, and that's good because it makes it less scary to put something on the design wall or to put something down on paper because you know it doesn't have to be perfect or even good you just have to begin. Other thoughts? Yeah, it's, there's something to be said for swatching. So knitters, um, well, I'm a knitter too, and yeah, I find swatches to be annoying, but there is something great about testing something out in a very small way, and there you can undo it and still reuse the yarn, which you can't always do with the fabrics that you're using. Um, but there are some projects where it takes me months working through different ideas to come up with what will be the, the one that we launch off into, um, especially when I'm working with fabrics that I can't replenish right um, so I work with some things that are finite um, uh, sort of honorary memorial quilts where you're using the clothing <laughs> of your loved one uh, it can be more daunting to chop into those fabrics uh, because a mis any mistake feels a little bit more painful um, I, I so in my day job, I write a lot. <laughs> and so I, I have a similar blank whenever I sit down to that blank screen. It's just sort of like, oh my gosh, how am I ever going to get through this project? And so you have to kind of turn off all the judgment that's in your head um, in both writing and quilting in order to get to get anywhere, I think. Yeah, I'm familiar with, with all that judgment in your head <laughs> as you get, get started. Um, 
Yeah, I'm in the midst of a major writing project now, so I'm, I'm feeling it. Um, Sean, I wanted to do it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sean, I particularly wanted to, to check in with you. I, I know you're an academic mathematician, um, and I wondered if that also relates to these, and, and of course you, you write, you write about math, and you're a quilt maker, an artist. Like, how do these three things uh, intersect in your world? Um, for a long time, they didn't um, by design. So I'm, I work in a male dominated profession. So any sense that anyone would know that I was a culture was something I didn't want out there uh, until I was fully promoted to full professor. Um, and just a few weeks ago, I was given an endowed chair. So now I can be freely out and no one can do yes. anything. Right? <laughs> um, but I, so in fact, the quilting was what I did to escape from that world. And so I desperately tried not to pursue any sort of mathematical themes in my quilts. Um, were I to be forced to make a quilt today uh, that had any sort of mathematical relation, it would be a whole bunch of puns that very few people would understand, right? So um, I'm not sure I will ever embark on that quilt. Yeah, I was wondering if it was sort of like a, I mean, to be simplistic, a right brain, left brain, kind of keep these um, things separate or, yeah. No, you know, the level of create, so higher level of math is more like philosophy. Okay. So again, connecting in back into that writing. So when you read my journal articles, the only numbers are the page numbers. So it is a very linguistic uh, science. Um, it, we call ourselves the humanists of the science. Uh, and um, and so, yeah, no, the, the, love, the creativity is very different. And I've actually been on panels about sort of what, it, what is the difference in the creative process um, between science and art. And that's fascinating. There's neuroscience research related to it and everything, which I learned on the panel. It was awesome. Fantastic. Um, does anyone want to jump in with any final comments before we turn to our, um, we've got a lot of, of stuff going on in the Q&A. We want to make sure we have a chance for our audience to ask some questions as well. Meg? Well, I guess what I wanted to say is that uh, just f for all the quilters out there, I think that in, in very, very many ways, quilts speak for themselves. But I just want to put in a plug for letting your quilt speak even louder by putting a label on it. That's an important place for words and quilts to come together. <laughs> Amen. And, and that, of course, is one of the um, key goals of the Quilt Alliance, the national nonprofit participating and um, host, hosting this um, today's session of the Textile Talks. And along with always labeling your quilts, we, we do want to expand our oral history project even more. We're at a really great transitional state uh, with the QSOS um, oral History Project. We have a new archival partnership with the Louis B. Nunn Center for Oral History at the University of Kentucky, where we've been able to get all of the audio digitized, and which is why we're able to, to launch this podcast, Running Stitch. And we are really excited about continuing to build on, on the current momentum and really advance this project into the, into the 21st century and uh, um, share it with more and more people. Um, so Hopefully we, we can interview each, each of you quilt makers as well for the QSOS project. I'm going to turn now to, I'm gonna pull up the, the Q&A. Um, some of these have been um, uh, addressed as, as they've been asked. Um, let me see here. Jonathan, if you want some help calling these, Emma sort of went through and pulled Perfect. questions that are um, sort of, uh, addressed to everyone. Wonderful. Because, uh, first, let me just say, if you haven't asked your question and you want to um, use this second of me talking to enter your question, please do. Um, I feel like I've just finished an amazing book of short stories in the middle of a really cool gallery of quilts. So uh, I hope you feel the same. That was fantastic. And it's just not long enough to fit in more conversation because there's some really good questions. We're going to try to save all the questions and send them to our panelists. Um, but I also really encourage you to contact them directly too if your question doesn't get answered because we're probably going to run out of time. And Emma posted in the chat um, everyone's contact information they shared on the slides. 
and remember this is being recorded too, so you'll be able to access those slides. Um, we'll also post a link to the slides that we used, okay? Um, so, um, Yana, can you want me just to read them out? And then, so the first one is uh, for everyone. Do you find that people uh, learn from your quilt? Sometimes the visual tells a stronger story than the written word. As writers, which do you feel is stronger to you, the quilting, the writing, or the quilting? I would, say, I would say a lot of people learn from uh, the work that I do, especially when it focuses on culture and history and language uh, for Dakota people. And um, that seems to be a less intimidating uh, format for uh, people to come to this history. And um, I, I really appreciate the comments that I get when people see my work or, and the questions that they have or the realization that there's more to learn and they want, want to learn more. So that I think is what I, what I really value about that interaction with people. Quilts um, are less intimidating sometimes than history books. Or math books. <laughs> math books are awesome. But um, I do want to say that uh, despite us having used the medium of the quilt for a long, long time, it still has the element of surprise when you uh, use them to express things that they're not expecting to be confronted with in that venue. And I think that we can all start making those quilts and it'll still hold that power. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Well, I would just say that um, the uh, Quilt Folk magazine is doing something it's never done before, which is uh, we're, we're taking in reader submissions and we're going through 250 reader submissions. But having the experience of going through uh, the stories and the pictures, it's, it's amazing how they complement each other. And there are some quilts that you would look at and say, yeah nice quilt but if you knew the story behind it if you knew how this person helped her mother with dementia make that quilt it would it would look completely different to you so it's uh i am having a whole lesson uh, mm. <laughs> about how 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 the two uh, work together and magnify each other and quilts are very very powerful and i and i love what sean just said about how uh carrying different kinds of messages in them it's 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 and it's a whole new power um it's the old and the new and the, all of that happening at, at once i think is a very powerful thing right now and it's one of the reasons why quilts are still a powerful medium this question is a good segue to that um for anyone on the panel do you consider yourself a risk taker if yes in what ways i guess that could be writing or quilting or both hmm. Sean looked like you were going to say something. Um, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, so back in the day, I used to call myself a stunt crafter. Um, and I keep asking myself the question, how much smaller can I make this log cabin, right? Um, and that the same thing comes in how, how can I test the boundaries of propriety in the text that I choose to put on a quilt or whatever expression I'm trying to make. And um, sometimes I go way over the line on purpose. And um, other times it really is just trying to hug the line and keep people in the boat so that we can continue having a conversation. So yes, I take risks. Too many sometimes. <laughs> I feel like I take risks um, in, in perhaps a different way, although my guess is there's some overlapping and that I always want to make quilts that I can't make. Um, and, <laughs> you know, and a lot, and, and, you know, I was thinking, my, I don't know that my quilts would teach anyone anything other than imperfectionism is okay. And you can still make a decent quilt. It's not perfect, but I do. I love trying, I love messing around and I do. And I, I feel like in, creative work in general, whether you're writing or quilting or whatever it is that you love to do, it's like you should always be 
trying to do something you can't and always trying, you know, that that's where the, I think that's where the joy and the excitement is. I mean, and it's where the failure is as well, but I'm also a big believer in, in failing. <laughs> but, so anyway, so yeah, so it's so, I, but I do, I like trying things that I can't actually do. I think that's great. And I, I have found that to be true, that I try and say yes to things that sometimes are scary to me. And I was asked to go on the quilt show, uh, TV show with uh, Ricky Timms and Alex Anderson. And then, then they told me after I said yes, that I would have to be uh, in a challenge. I would have to make a quilt about Broadway. They were each making a Broadway quilt. And, and I'm like, ah, <laughs> and then I would have to demo it on camera. So that was, I didn't, no, I was in for that bigger risk, but I ended up doing a word quilt. I had, my my uh, composer was Stephen Sondheim, and I did a quilt about Into the Woods, and I covered the trees with words, and all the leaves had uh, Cinderella's first and last words are, I wish, and so mm. it's, a, it's a quilt about Broadway covered with words, <laughs> but it felt very scary. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I, um, Gwen, did you want to answer that one too? Do you want to say anything else? Oh, you're looking Are at you a risk taker who used to jump off of the roof of the house with an umbrella trying to be Mary Poppins. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can be a risk taker. Um, and sometimes it's, it, it's, it's so spontaneous that it doesn't seem like a risk. Um, but um, I hand dye a lot of fabric and um, it's, it's one of those situations where you never know what you're going to get and that's that's a, a more mundane example of the risk <laughs> that i take <laughs> but but a risk none, nonetheless um i hate to cut off the questions because there are so many so we're going to save all of these and uh we're going to share um everyone's contact information again uh, please do uh, reach out to our panelists and ask them your question. I'm sure they would appreciate that. And I want to share my screen real quick before we go. Um, one more thing here. Whoops. Um, if you enjoyed this presentation, this panel discussion, please join us for our big virtual event in September, Quilters Take a Moment, previously known as Quilters Take Manhattan. Um, and it's a virtual event with all of the same programming we had planned for Quilters Take Manhattan. Um, and you can reach us at information at quiltalliance.org or visit us online. And thank you everyone for, um, for attending this textile talk. And if you want to listen again, you'll have a chance or you want to tell a friend about it. It has been recorded and uh, you can access it via SACWA site, anyone, uh, our website, anyone in the textile talks group. Thank you all. Thank you panelists and Yannick and you all were wonderful. Thanks, Amy. Oh, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks, everybody. This was very fun. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.